Well, if I'm talking about myself, I guess I better start at the beginning. I was born in May, on May 17th, 1923. And um, an interesting little detail there is that when my mother had me at Abingdon Hospital, um, the delivery I see by a receipt we have was $5. And uh, my mother's bill from Abingdon for two weeks uh, there at the hospital when I was born, uh, with no complications, but just uh, that's the way they kept people at those times in, in the hospital for a long time, uh, was $30. So uh, it didn't cost an awful lot to, <laughs> to get me started. <laughs> but oh boy, have they paid since then. <laughs> of course, the other half of my parents is my mother, <laughs> was my mother, <laughs> and a very important person in their family. Um, she held things together. She, um, very frankly, uh, uh, protected us somewhat from our, our at times, um, um, inflammatory father. I don't say inflammatory is the right word, but, but he was very, stri very strict, and um, she was our protection. Uh, and as in colonial times, in a way, um, we pretty much used our own vegetables. We grew here. Um, uh, during the war, my dad had um, ducks, which uh, were prepared, and, 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 and we ate. Uh, and uh, so she took care of a lot of the sewing and knitting and, 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 and the household chores and the washing. She had to carry the wash down to the basement, around outside of the house and down in the basement for an old washing wa clothes washer and an old uh, ringer washer. It had a ringer on it, and and uh, then hung hung the clothes on the line, clothes, sheets, whatever. So she had a lot of work to do. But in addition to that, uh, she supported Dad in some of the things he was doing. For example, uh, when he made. Uh, at one point he was making magazine covers. That is to say, he was uh, making uh, puppet sets, you might call it, mannequin sets, uh, in three dimension. And she would dress the mannequins. Uh, and these were anywhere from, you know, eight inches to maybe uh, 13, 15 inches tall. And uh, that's very meticulous sewing, much more difficult than sewing uh, human clothes. Uh, she, <laughs> she, pardon me, she enjoyed nasturtiums. So we always planted nasturtiums out back here for her, uh, which then we found, of course, they had to be weeded. <laughs> so we weeded them. And uh, that brings me around to uh, dead was basically a farmer, you know. Uh, he, he grew up on a farm in Michigan, and uh, he couldn't get it out of his blood. So when he, he, he was an artist, but he had to have something. He, he couldn't see the 70 acres of our farm not be used for farming, and it wasn't used at the time they bought the place. So uh, he talked to our, our county agent at the time, and uh, the county agent suggested blending Christmas trees. Well, that sounded good to him, so he uh, bought uh, a bunch of seedling Christmas trees, small, very small trees, uh, from Maine. Uh, that's where they were available, and planted them in the garden. Uh, and uh, guess who did the weeding of those trees? <laughs> uh, my brother and I. My brother, Corridan, was four years older than I was, and um, um, he has since died but uh, he uh, lived a good life. Uh, he was also pretty artistic and um, uh, made furniture, handmade furniture, and uh, uh, worked for George Nakashima for a while and then started making his own furniture of that style. In any event, uh, we weeded the trees and um, almost all of them died. We had a, a bad drought that summer 
uh, after, and, and uh, they came from Maine, so they came late for our season, early for their season, late for ours. So it was a bad situation. So he, Dad learned by that, as you do in farming. You learn about, by mistakes. And, and uh, so he ordered from, from a more southerly area and not nearly as many, <laughs> which we were glad of. Uh, but it was also our, our job, uh, my brother and I, to, uh, to care for the trees. Well, we don't care, didn't care for them as, uh, as we do now, uh, not nearly as much um, uh, caring. Uh, the main thing we did was to uh, plant them from the garden into the field when they were large enough. And that was be, you know, they were maybe a, a foot, foot and a half uh, uh, high, tall. And, and then before Christmas tree season, we'd go out and uh, with a scythe and brush hook and, and uh, a sickle, uh, cut down uh, briars, uh, blackberries, uh, sumac. That was before the days of Mundle Flora Rose, fortunately. And <clears throat> So uh, that kept us busy during that time, then helping uh, uh, with the people coming and getting trees. My recollection is that the first trees Dad sold, uh, I guess in 1932, uh, he charged, I think, 65 cents a piece for them. Uh, so that gives you a kind of a perspective on the difference in value of, of uh, commodities then versus now. Um, when I was, I don't know, uh, maybe, 11 or 12, somewhere through there. Uh, my, my brother became interested in, in trees. So my dad thought, well, we'll encourage him. And uh, so he, gave, he let us, uh, gave, my, gave my brother an hour off after lunch every day uh, during the summer to study trees. Oh boy, I couldn't see him get away with that. Uh, so I decided to have an interest too, and I thought about it for a while, and I, uh, I thought it'd be interesting to, to, to spend an hour each day thinking, uh, looking, or studying about birds. So I, um, uh, my dad agreed, and uh, so uh, a little technique I developed was our cat liked to sleep in a basket. We also uh, had some cherry trees down below the house. And so I would put the cat in the basket, take him down to, and he liked to sleep during the day, uh, take him down to the cherry trees where there were a lot of birds and uh, sit there and observe. As the birds came down to scold the cat, I got close up look <laughs> at the birds, uh, which was fun. Then I bought my first, uh, uh, not binoculars, but um, uh, glasses. They're about a, a very low power four or five, I don't know, power. And uh, then this developed into, uh, believe it or not, a, 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 a thorough interest in conservation. Uh, we call it environmental conservation. At that time, we just conservation. Now, I went to my primary school, first, second, third, and fourth, but it, I did, Don Fitting's mother, Helen Fitting, was my teacher for all four grades, except I was only there for three grades because uh, I did homework for one of the grades uh, uh, ahead of time, listening to what the kids in third grade were doing. And so she skipped me that grade. And I, I went, so I did the, the four grades in three years. Uh, uh, and and uh, then I went on to grammar school, which was just a, a building a, a few hundred yards down 263. Again, uh, it's still a dirt road. And um, uh, there was fourth, fifth, pardon me, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grades being taught by one teacher in one room. Uh, I did fifth, sixth, and seventh grades, but by the time I got to eighth, a couple of families had moved away, and it, uh, it was apparent that I was going to be the only person in eighth grade. And that wasn't a good situation, so my parents um, decided to put me into Buckingham Friends School down the road the other way, uh, a couple of miles, and I was there uh, for eighth grade. Now, an interesting little thing occurred is that my teacher in eighth grade was Tom Ritchie, uh, who many of the residents uh, later on knew him as Dr. Tom Ritchie. Well, he was a teacher at that time, an elementary school teacher, 
Uh, I went on about my way to uh, George School for four years and on down to Guilford College in North Carolina for uh, three years. I was away um, in college and uh, during my service uh, uh, during the war and uh, for a, a couple, three years, three or four years in West Virginia as a, uh, in working in conservation. And when I came back, moved back to the farm, uh, there was Tom Ritchie. He was, became my doctor. Because in the meantime, while I was flitting around the various parts of the country, he had gone back to medical school, became a, 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 a practicing doctor. Oh, well, t <laughs> Tom, as I always called him, uh, delivered our three children. Uh, I was married in 1952 to Marjorie. Uh, I had come back uh, to West Virginia, um, um, after, or went to West Virginia rather, after my uh, graduation from uh, Iowa State University, where I got my master's. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so we got married in 1952 and, and moved up here. Uh, and um, uh, then the three children followed uh, Sylvia, Lee, and Kitty, in that order. Uh, each about two years apart. Kitty was three years from her brother. And um, at the present time, Lee lives on the farm. Uh, Kitty is in New York City, and uh, Sylvia, uh, and she's married, and Sylvia uh, got married, and she's in Indiana. Well, um, so I, I graduated from from, well, I, I was in. I went back to Guilford. Going back to Guilford College, that was, uh, I was there for three years, not four, because uh, that was during the war years, starting in 1940, and it was seen, seemed obvious that we were going to be drafted sometime. So the uh, Friends Service Committee worked out a um, a program, an accelerated educational program for we who were in college at Guilford who might become a, a conscientious objectors uh, to speed up our studies so that we might be able to get out before we got drafted. Well, we almost got out. Uh, we were almost graduated in time, but not quite. I still had three hours or four hours, one or the other, uh, left to complete my gra gra uh, graduation, my bachelor's degree. But I was drafted anyway and went to um, was sent to uh, uh, Tennessee, eastern Tennessee, uh, in the Smoky Mountains uh, as a beginning, um, as a conscientious, conscientious objector. Uh, and we did, in all these camps, we did what the, the civil service uh, defined as work of national importance. We questioned how important national uh, uh, our work was often, as far as national importance is concerned. But we were given a job, and, and in Tennessee, uh, we were assigned to what had been a CCC camp, which is Civilian Conservation Corps, which was set up by uh, during the uh, uh, Roosevelt administration, <clears throat> the Franklin Roosevelt administration, uh, for uh, uh, young men, yeah, I think pretty much young men, uh, to have work and be paid for it. A low wage, but there, it was work. And so, uh, those uh, camps had expired by the time uh, the, um, the uh, civilian um, service conscience objector uh, uh, program went into effect. So we were often, not always, but often uh, housed in old CCC camps. And there my work was um, primarily of clearing brush from trails and, and making it nice for, for tourists, uh, those who few tourists who still came. But eventually, um, because of my interest in biology, I was uh, helped out in the infirmary at, at times and later on uh, was uh, assigned to go, took a, call, a, a crew of um, a dozen and a half, two dozen of the fellows who were habitually sick and took them over uh, out of the camp to uh, the other side <laughs> of the mountain uh, so they would not uh, uh, hold back and uh, uh, create uh, uh, 
you know, negative uh, pessimism uh, about the work. And so I was put in charge of uh, their welfare as far as um, taking care of them medically, as far as cooking for them, uh, all around a um, variety of jobs. Uh, then I was uh, transferred to uh, Mount Weather, Virginia, near, near um, uh, not too far from Winchester, Virginia, uh, and uh, served there. It, that was a, uh, a research station for uh, the Weather Bureau. And uh, we were working on statistics for uh, long-range weather forecasting. Long-range, three-day forecasting. <laughs> uh, and uh, but there again, I, because of my my medical uh, affiliation <laughs> with the with the guys down in the, in Tennessee, I was put in charge of the infirmary for this camp. Uh, we did have a doctor come in once a week, and I also did the cooking for the uh, the special diets for the, those who got sick, and uh, a variety of other odd jobs, uh, which included uh, cleaning the bathrooms and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you always, that always has to be done. Then the, the place I've been trying to get to uh, in, in my application as a conscience objector from the very beginning was, uh, was uh, the Patuxent Wildlife Research Refuge. That's what I put was my first choice every time I had a chance. Well, like in the Army, they didn't send you to your first, first choice. But eventually, in the last uh, five months or so of my uh, three years in, in CPS, civilian public service camps, um, I was assigned to the Patuxent Wildlife Re Research Refuge uh, near, um, near Laurel, Maryland. And there I uh, assisted the uh, biologist uh, who was studying nutrition of quail, bobwhite quail, as uh, and, and from that, we got learned a lot about the nutrition needs of human beings, uh, especially in relation to uh, vitamin A and vitamin D. So that, uh, in, in three years, my service, uh, I was discharged, my service uh, uh, was complete, and that's when I uh, um, went to uh, Iowa State, and uh, after a, a couple of year and a half, year and three quarters there, uh, took a job in West Virginia uh, in, in their wildlife department. And, uh, and I, was, I, was, I was there from 1948 to 52, about four years. That's when I moved back up here. Conservation. Uh, I can't talk about uh, Solbury without talking about the uh, Solbury history, without talking about the, the, the general store at Solbury, uh, run by Wilmont Quimby. <clears throat> uh, and this, this I remember from, I guess, all, all the 30s and, and uh, at least the early 40s. Uh, you could buy anything there, uh, I guess, just about anything. No, no computers, but <laughs> you, you could buy boots, uh, you could buy groceries, meat, um, candy bars, ice cream cones. Oh boy, do I remember that from my, kid, my childhood. Uh, you could buy the women could buy um, yard goods from which they made their clothes and other things. Uh, you could buy shovels and picks and all kinds of uh, tools. You could buy kerosene, which was more important then than now, of course. Uh, you could buy gasoline, the old gasoline pump out there that you, 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 you had a, 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 I don't know, a five gallon, I see, suppose, uh, uh, piece of glass uh, that uh, you pumped gasoline up into, the, into that with a hand pump uh, up into that glass and then open uh, the valve uh, as you put it into the uh, car and let it drain down to the bottom and then you know how much gasoline you got. Uh, there, there was, um, uh, I, I can't begin to cover all the things which they had. It was a general store. Uh, now, there, there was that general store only a mile away, but believe it or not, my mother made a list of things she needed to the store, and about once a week, we went down there and got it. Didn't go to the supermarket every other day. She went down to, and had made a list of things that, that, that she needed for about a week or so. 
Um, there are also, I, I have to say, there were hardly any restaurants around. I don't remember. There, we have a couple of historic restaurants that are, that are here now that were there then, but um, my main memory is that we ate at home. Uh, once in a while, we ate out. We'd go into Philadelphia and get a Chinese <laughs> dinner, uh, a dinner at a Chinese restaurant, and, uh, and, and that was very special. So uh, ways were very much different then. And uh, uh, we, we didn't know, we couldn't anticipate what things would be like a few years later. But uh, they indeed have changed. As a matter of fact, by the time I moved back uh, here to Solbury in 1952, uh, things had changed. Uh, as I recall, there was not the general store operating there now but the, the, uh, at that time, but uh, there was more of a, uh, a deli. Um, there certainly was later on. It had several different owners in turn run it, go out of business, run it, someone else buy it, run it and go out of business. But um, uh, then it just became, eventually became just the post office. Oh, I should have said earlier that that was our, our post office too back in those early days as well as being a general store. It combined everything. Um, and. Uh, they didn't have uh, any EPA to overlook their gasoline station or anything else. Um, now, I, uh, I was in a community. When I moved back here, I was in a community. I hadn't been in a community when I was in West Virginia. I was in Charleston, the capital city, and I wasn't part of a community. Here, you couldn't help but be part of a community. And uh, we had a my folks, along with the others, uh, started a cooperative association in which they uh, made out an order together for groceries. Mostly it was canned goods, as I recall. And, um, and the canned goods would be shipped in uh, and, and to one of our houses. And everybody would come and pick up the appropriate uh, number of cans of whatever that they ordered. Uh, and that was becoming very successful and and so because it was a lot cheaper to buy it that way than to buy it in the regular store so we rented a uh, space uh, in, uh, in New Hope on the um, American store which is where Benny Seiden's drugstore eventually is was and and I don't know the name of the store but it's uh, it's on uh, Main Street and Bridge Street the intersection there and so the co-op association <laughs> rented shelf space uh, in the American store. Then later on, uh, did better yet, and and were able to uh, finance the, the buying of a building, uh, and uh, there, and that's now the uh, uh, the bookstore. Um, what's the name of the bookstore? Anyway, the bookstore on on. Uh, South Main Street. And being a kind of proactive person, I got on the board and, and uh, eventually became president. Uh, and that uh, co-op association lasted quite a few years. Uh, we even uh, developed, uh, in addition to a, a grocery store, which it was, uh, we developed a frozen food area, uh, a locker room, a locker a addition on the back of that building which, in which uh, cold uh, freezer lockers could be rented. We, we, a person would rent the locker, uh, buy materials, uh, foods in, in bulk and, and put them in the locker and, and go down and pick it up when they picked up their groceries. Uh, then we had a, a, a butcher in that uh, store, in that uh, frozen food section, uh, that would cut up meat for us. And put it in the freezer and we'd take some home, put the rest in the freezer so it'd, be, it'd keep. Uh, that was before people had home freezers, but uh, things kept changing. Then I was also interested, uh, because of my affinity to, uh, to wildlife management and, uh, and environmental affairs, uh, I became uh, interested in, in uh, 
the, 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 what's going on in way of uh, land management in the area. Uh, I helped organize the what we call the Natural Resources Association, which uh, was focused on uh, the watersheds of Solbury, from Ponacussing down to Pidcock, including uh, in, including Aquatong and others. Uh, that was going along, kind of getting started, when the Philadelphia Electric, Philadelphia Electric Company and the Pen Highway Department decided to put a, an expressway, they called it a parkway at that time, a four-lane parkway through the center of Solbury uh, and with the power line, a high-tension high power line, going through parallel with it. Uh, and some of us took great exception to that, and uh, uh, this was in the beginnings of uh, the Honey Hollow Watershed Association, and we became very active in opposing uh, the routing of this. Now, you couldn't oppose the need for electricity, you couldn't oppose the need for a highway, although in a way we, we could. I, we, we still can. Um, but uh, we didn't want it to go right through the middle of the Honey Hollow watershed, uh, which was an, an, an used for, for environmental education at the time, and still it is. So uh, we mounted a campaign and we uh, tried to get uh, money, and um, we uh, were at one time, and this was you know in the late sixties. Seven thousand dollars, over seven thousand dollars in debt, and we wouldn't know what in the world we're going to, how we're going to pay that off. But anyway, uh, we we finally uh, negotiated a a, uh, a compromise, and I defined a compromise at the time as uh, an agreement which nobody was happy with. We we uh, got a compromise uh, as far as the alignment of the power line, so it did not go through the center. It went along on the edge of the watershed, and um, uh, but it still went through. The the uh, highway could not be built because by that time we had been the we the Honey Hollow watershed had been uh, cited as a. Uh, landmark area for a uh, national historic landmark. And so the de uh, U.S. Department of Interior uh, could, not, uh, could not agree to have federal money spent on, uh, uh, for breaking up this landmark. And so the, la the highway had to go around it. Then it became a 90 percent instead of a 10% cost to the state, became a 90% cost, and it wasn't feasible anymore uh, for the state to put this uh, four-lane highway. Uh, that that four-lane highway on our farm itself, itself would have taken up all of my Christmas tree field and the, these buildings, and uh, 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 so it would have been done great personal damage to us in addition to damaging um, well, doing away really with the, the landmark status of, uh, of the watershed. Let me go back for a moment because uh, I, I was starting to talk about my interest in the environment in the, in the area. Well, um, the Honey Hollow Watershed Association was, was started, I was one of the founders of it, uh, in order to um, uh, promote well, it started really as a reaction against the power line and, and the, and the um, uh, highway. But uh, the di Northeast Director of the National Park Service uh, suggested as we were winding down uh, our opposition and we were winning, our op uh, winning to the compromise, uh, that this was an ideal place for an, an environmental education center being between New York and Philadelphia, near Princeton and, and all this urban area. And it, wouldn't it be great to uh, have, give people the opportunity, adults and children both, the opportunity to learn more about the natural environment and how uh, it affected them and how they affect the environment. 
So we uh, went on with the, with the Honey Hollow Watershed Association and became positive rather than negative, positive in promoting uh, environmental education instead of negative, just opposing uh, the destruction of the area. And that was uh, like, you know, seven, 1970 or so. And um, so this did advance, and uh, with the help of the uh, Bucks County Audubon Society that was formed about that same time, um, the educational program grew from, from just volunteers uh, doing the teaching. Um, we had some very talented people in the area, to uh, volunteers plus staff. Uh, and, and so eventually the Honey Hollow Watershed Association's uh, education program was transferred over to the Bucks County Audubon Society where it now exists. Uh, and so it's been going on for uh, what, 30, nearly four, about 40 years now, uh, which um, is, is, is a pretty, re pretty good record. Texas, Palestine, Texas. How, I were, how well I remember that. And you know, lots of times, uh, things are, that are bad at the time turn out to be good. Well, our, the water pump in, in the car uh, started leaking and, and, and leaking badly. So I stopped in Palestine, Texas to have it fixed. And the fellows who fixed it, they had to wait for a while. This was right at the end of the war. Uh, they had to wait for a part to be shipped in from Dallas, which took several days. Uh, and then uh, they put it on, but they didn't screw on the bolts on the fan, which was connected to the fan and the, and the water pump were connected. Water pump were connected by, by a belt. Start down the road. Whoop! The uh, uh, fan went right through the radiator. <laughs> then we had big time trouble. Well, they towed me back, and they again had to send to Dallas. And uh, this was a, a you know a 1936 Ford, I think, panel truck. And uh, I, uh, uh, so I was in Palestine, and I didn't have money to speak of. Sure didn't have money to stay there for a week, which they said it would be. So I tried to look up a, a, a fuller brush dealer. I had been a, a fuller brush salesman uh, during the last few months of my uh, time in, uh, in, in CPS in Laurel, Maryland, and I'd, I'd been able to land a job with uh, the fuller brush company and had a, 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 a a territory in suburban Washington in Maryland. So I'd gotten connected with the Fuller Brush people. Uh, and so I contacted, looked up, and found there was a Fuller Brush man in, uh, in Palestine, Texas, elderly. He was delighted to see me. I was delighted to see him because he said, go ahead and sell brushes. I don't want to go out anymore for a while. So. Uh, he said, by the way, uh, I, I, I do pretty well in selling these uh, sponge mops. Well, I'd never seen one before. It was a, it was a, a you know, plastic sponge mop for, for um, uh, floors. So I, um, I sold those too. And while I was there, I got, of course, the contact of where he, these came from in Chicago. And after arriving in uh, in San Diego, which is where I headed, uh, again, I looked up the uh, Fuller Brush Company and they gave me a territory that was a, a terrible, very, um, uh, very low uh, uh, paying people, uh, uh, you know, income people, uh, very poor section of San Diego, but eh, it was a job. So I started selling photo brushes and the, these mops. And I sold more mops than I did fuller brushes. Uh, and so I earned enough money so I could pay, not only pay for my time there, I could also pay for my trip back to Iowa to graduate school. And I ended up in Iowa, Iowa State, and uh, again, the fuller brush people didn't have anybody in, in the college town of uh, Ames. And so I got that job and I sold the brushes and the mops. Again, I sold more mops uh, in money and income. <laughs> I sold brushes, if you could believe it at that time. And everybody was welcoming the Fuller Brush Man at that time because they hadn't seen a Fuller Brush Man for maybe three years. And 
these were very well known brushes at the time, maybe they still are, I don't know, and I sold more hairbrushes and more uh, uh, mops than you can believe. Uh, so uh, that tragedy in, in, uh, in Palestine, Texas ended up uh, really paying off for me uh, and, and I ended up uh, school uh, beyond paying tuition and room and board and all this stuff, I ended up with money in my pocket. Uh, so uh, that was just an interesting sidelight of, uh, of something I got involved with. Uh, I also worked as a taxi driver at one point in Washington, Bethesda, actually. <clears throat> I was in CPS in Virginia at the time and I went into, often went into Washington, D.C. for um, uh, you know, uh, for a while I worked at a child's restaurant as a, as a waiter. My, that was hard work. Uh, and, and you took an awful lot of abuse. Uh, as, and I feel so, so sympathetic with waiters and waitresses these days. Uh, I don't know if they get the same abuse, but we sure did at that time. And one day I was hitchhiking in one Friday afternoon. I was hitchhiking into Washington and a taxi stopped. I said, oh, no, no, no. I, I, I can't afford to pay a taxi. He said, no, that's all right. Come on. I'm just going to Washington. You, you, I won't charge you anything. So we were in and talking, and, and uh, it ended up that uh, he took me on as his, uh, as his helper for weekends. So I drove, uh, I got to drive his cab, which was a, a private car with cab on the, written on it someplace, uh, and, and out in Bethesda, Maryland. Well, I had never even really been to Bethesda, Maryland before. But I got a map and a flashlight, <laughs> and, uh, and I drove um, I drove taxi in Bethesda until there started to be a taxi war, and then I withdrew from, from my taxi experience. But uh, uh, and, and another thing that a little sidelight when I was at, uh, at Mount Weather, uh, my brother was there prior to my being there as well as while I was there, and he told the guys there that I was a, I cut hair. Well, I guess I cut hair, <laughs> but anyway, when I got to the Mount Weather, uh, I bought a pair of scissors and a comb and, and uh, some hand clippers <clears throat> and uh, set up shop and I, I cut hair for 25 cents a head. <laughs> and uh, so I was able to, uh, to, again, always, it's always a matter of, you know, there, there, it's great to be poor. There's always an incentive to doing things that are interesting, and you learn more things when you're poor than when you're rich. And uh, so that's one of the lessons I have learned in my lifetime. I became uh, very interested in what was happening in Sobury Township uh, back when they were first proposing a zoning ordinance. Uh, and uh, Russell Van Ness Black, an architect, landscape architect, Pretty well known uh, was kind of head of that head of that uh, zoning study up. Uh, Russell Van S. Bleck, by the way, uh, was also a Christmas tree grower, so I visited him quite often frequently. And eventually, the Sobury Township did pass a, a zoning ordinance. This was before they did any planning. Well, it's the reverse of what should happen. You got to plan first, and then have your zoning. But this that, that's all right. We finally got a zoning ordinance, and uh, so I, uh, I, I was very intent on working with the township to try and get planning established. Uh, and that's when Bill Tinsman, who was uh, a, a, a Bill E. Tinsman, no, the older Bill, Bill Tinsman, uh, yeah, um, who had died uh, maybe a year ago, uh, was on the, on the uh, township uh, Commission, committee, uh, township board, and uh, he invited me in to be uh, serve on the land um, land use committee. Well, sir, soon it was changed to the land preservation committee. So I've been a member, uh, an, an active participant in the land preservation committee for quite a few years. Uh, I don't know, eight, ten years, something like that, and. Uh, the objective of this was to uh, preserve as much land, uh, good agricultural land, and, and critical areas where there are streams and steep slopes are involved as possible uh, uh, for environmental improvement of the township or stabilization of the township. Um, 
And so at this point, uh, including what the county has done and the state has done in their state lands, which we have some state lands, uh, we have about uh, 3,300 of the 5,000 acres in the township under preservation, which is a pretty good hunk. Uh, and, uh, and we're seeing the effects of it. The school board is seeing the effects of not having uh, rapidly increased students, uh, a number of students. And therefore, uh, they're talking more about eliminating schools than building schools, and just the other way around in the past. Uh, where is Silbury Township going? Well, uh, there are going to be no more, as I, I, I can't see that there are any, going to be any more uh, large developments, like uh, North Point. That's a big development. There might be some medium-sized developments, but not many. Very restricted. So the uh, wholesale development of, of Solbury uh, is not in the cards because of our land preservation program. And, uh, and therefore, taxes will be abated because most of our taxes are school taxes. So we, our taxes won't go down, but they won't be skyrocketing like they have been, uh, as I see it. We have uh, a couple of major problems in the township still, however. One is, uh, the main one is water. Uh, where um, uh, the newer developments have been uh, built uh, along 202 near New Hope, uh, there is, uh, that's all well water, it's drawn from the ground, the water that's used, drawn from the, gr drawn from the ground, used, goes into uh, a sewer line that goes over the Delaware River and into Lambertville treatment plant and into the Delaware. So all the water that is being drawn out of the ground is exported out of the watershed. Uh, I believe the reading now is that we have a deficit of water resources in that area right now. And with more, some more development, commercial and otherwise, sure to come, um, there'll be an even greater deficit. I, and, and there are areas like around the quarry uh, uh, and, and, and the area drained by the quarry, uh, that is also a water deficit area, clearly. Uh, Sobrey Friends Meeting, for example, is on the edge of that. And we went from a well that was uh, provided all the water we needed from about, as I recall, 150 50, 50 to 175 feet. Now we're down 700 feet. And it can only produce, it can only produce about three gallons a minute, if that. Um, and uh, so that is, that is, I think, the real focus of our um, environmental uh, programs in the future rests on uh, learning and uh, providing for good quality and good quantity of water. Now we have done a lot in land preservation. There's still more to do. We still have some money left to buy conservation easements uh, and um, compensate the people who own the land for what they're giving up in value by giving us a conservation easement. But there's a lot more that needs to be done in addition to land conservation, uh, uh, the land preservation. It's so important that the citizens of Solbury Township uh, stay current with what is happening at the township government level, to attend uh, the supervisor meetings. A lot of things go on that you, you really need to know about, that which affect you directly, either in the short term or the long term. And the voice of the citizens is extremely important.